Hi everyone! Let's comment in these first slides some basics of game psychology. Games, in general, have been seen as dangerous or at least as useless in many moments of history, and even now. Most of you will know that chess game has been forbidden many times. Nevertheless, in recent times, it's seen as good, as good for children, even mandatory in some countries at the schools. We are kind of seeing this, the same, this same moment with video games these years. Ten years ago, it was usual to hear you are losing your time or you are not professional when an adult was playing a video game. It was like kids stuff, only for fun. Now we see very normal adults, uh, adults playing at Subway, even we recommend our old people to play games to maintain their mental abilities fresh. So when I ask, uh, what are video games for you? I used to hear things like... Educational, social, cultural, motivators, dynamic, interactive, creative, and so on. Oh, of course, fun. So apart from some controversy with violent games and video game addiction, it's widely recognized that video games are good for people. So these are some of abilities improved or developed by playing different video games. Self-esteem, imagination, motivation, overcoming, hand-eye coordination, and a long list of competencies or skills. So maybe playing is good for life after all. The interaction between people and games is strongly related to human psychology. Recent studies show that video games activate a large, large number of brain regions. Visual processing, visual spatial attention, motor function, sensory motor integration, and so on. What uh, could be surprising at first is that video games also activate key regions of the medial for brain pleasure circuit. Many studies show that playing video games increase dopamine release. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that plays important roles in the brain and body. It's related with reward system and pleasure, motivation, satisfaction. It's interesting that the studies show that wins, wins, winning generate dopamine. Quantity is significantly, significantly dependent on possibility to lose. That carries us to a very important component of video game psychology, which influences game design, flow. Flow is a very generic word used in many contexts. In games perspective has a meaning of balance, and in gamers has a meaning of deep attention and involvement. Uh, an objective of, the, of a game designer is to get and to maintain flow. Each level has to have a challenge, and the player needs to develop some skills. If the skills are too difficult, interest falls. If it's too easy, the same. If achievements are known, or too much, the same. Flow happens in the middle. Some authors speak about failure. Most of players are not motivated for games, so easy to win, with no lights lost, with no points rewarded at the first time. This is a paradox motivated for how our brain deals with the world along generations. We don't like failure. But we, we like feeling failure as long as no real things are loose and irreversible. Mistakes are an important part of learning. Video games bring us the opportunity to fail with no real loss. In the same way, we like going to theaters to watch a drama for sadness, but it's not our sadness. We play sadness. We play failure. Here are some other aspects involving flow playing a video game. Clear objectives are at each step, good balance between thought and action, we as humans love to think and love to act. And making both is important for flowing through a video game. Trying that fear of failure won't direct action, 
In often appropriate stimuli to hold attention, kind and amount of feelings depend on culture, on age, on social context. Uh, immediate interaction or feedback. Uh, some years ago, we allowed seconds between a key press and a screen answer. Now we enjoy having tenths of a second or even hundreds of a second of action reaction interval. Life is continuous and things happen immediately. So we flow with a game happening with that kind of interaction. Consistency and systemic experience. We hear a lot about the uh, memorable experiences now in game design and so on. Another interesting psychology aspect of video games is about empathy. Science has found that many empathic aspects have to do with mirror neurons. Maybe you know these neurons were discovered by chance. Scientists studying monkeys' uh, reactions discovered suddenly that monkeys reacted the same taking bananas that seeing one scientist doing it. That's the main purpose of mirror neurons. Feeling the same, doing an action, than seeing another in the environment doing it. This aspect of our mind doesn't only affect video games, it's a basic part of, the, of cinema, of art, and literature, and so on. In video games, we have to consider that the more the player identifies with the character of the game, more effective the game can be. That's why so many games have avatars, personalization, and many considerations of configuration and leveling. Uh, other related things is that with mirror neurons, you can learn. You learn doing, and you learn if someone in the screen does it and you empathize with it. You feel it, you learn it. That relates with immersion, a very strong and powerful characteristic of video games. Especially important in these years with the rival to market of low-cost virtual reality and augmented reality devices. Let's speak about player classification. Are all the humans equal while playing games? No, of course not. But it's important for video game designers uh, knowing something about the differences in some players. How could we design a game for all? Or at least for most players as possible? We'll see a couple of most known classifications. Richard Bartle, one of the most important game designers, the creator of Matt Multi-User Dungeons, it's one of the first researchers on video, video game players' behavior. He specialized in multiplayer games. You can see in this slide the Bartle taxonomy. He assumes four main types of uh, users. Killers or reefers, shivers, socializers, and explorers. Here you have the definition and one of the one of characteristics. The killers are defined by a focus to winning rank and direct peer-to-peer -peer competition. Achievers are defined by a focus on attaining status and achieving preset goals quickly and completely. Socializers, socializers are defined by a focus on socializing and try to develop a network of friends and contacts. Explorers have a focus on exploring and try to discover the world. It's important to know that each person does not belong to only one of these four types. Each player has aspects of all of them. Bartle developed tests to assign a percentage of it for each. In his studies, uh, related by the kind of games studied, socializer is the most common type uh, by 80% uh, of average. Explorer is the second, 50%. Achiever is the third, 40%. And killer is the last with only 20%. That means that players change styles, but socialization is the most common. Good games should balance the different motivations for different types of players. Here you have an online test to know the battle classification. Would you try? We have a more com complex taxonomy of Andrew Masreski, one of the most active researchers in gamification work. He initially defines this hexagon of profiles where the main driver of personality is the main motivation. It is used not exclusively for gamers, but for digital or social networks users. So we have uh, philanthropists, they look for a purpose that gives meaning to a system. They want to contribute with their acts and services, for example, contributors, contributors or, or to Wikipedia. 
disruptors motivated by several things, but generally want to generate noise in the system, direct, directly or indirectly, for example, trolls in forums or chats. Achievers, they want mastery to learn, to improve, challenges to overcome. This, uh, those players uh, who play to the end, final secret levels. Free spirits are players wanting to have autonomy, either in exploration or creativity in a system. They love personalization, travel around, very configurable avatars. Fifth the players, motivated by rewards, those who want to win, be the top one. And finally, socializers, they want interaction and relationship with other people. In a later version of the taxonomy, Masalski differentiated intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, producing eight different profiles, four common with previous one, and four new. Uh, the new are the one well, you have at the right, search seeker, <coughs> using seeking rewards for acting on others. Sorry. Um, for example, answering people questions yeah, for points, you prefer quantity over quality. Consumers, Seek for get, uh, to get rewards from the system with less possible interaction, for example, your loyalty schemes or basic competitions. Networkers seek to connect to others to increase their profile and the rewards that uh, they bring. And exploiters seek to gain reward from using the system, uh, possibly by any means, creating things, finding things, finding the loopholes, uh, etc. Masalski and other authors are giving importance to this difference between intrinsic, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Some of them comment that one factor of success in new digital, digital tools and games are intrinsic motivation they are capable of, of, of obtaining. <clears throat> Teachers know this from the beginning of time. The difference between a student motivated only by the result or by grading, um, explicit rewards, or the student motivated by personal affinity, intellectual interest, which are rewards. Here you have the link to one very recommendable TED conference by Denny Pink. There is a short version with cartoons by RSA Animate, but it's worth seeing the whole. He does not talk about games, but motivation in life, and clearly differentiates, differentiates uh, extrinsic motivation from intrinsic. And it's very surprising research research data on motivation. If you like, uh, take some minutes to watch it. Daniel speaks of three main intrinsic motivators, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. In addition to motivators addressed by Pink, we can also speak of intrinsic social motivators. Possibility of sharing and changing, a sense of belonging to a community, cooperation and competition. So, finishing this chapter, why do we, we play? Substantial reasons are personal and social. Personal ones are achievement and mastery, immersion and exploration. Social reasons are competition and socialization, cooperation. In some ways, that are also the substantial reasons for anything in life, not just for games. And again, each person has a different and evolving combination of all these. All of these are very connected to our learning as a species with human evolution, achievements, perception of reality, ancestral curiosity, combat, victory, friendship, recognition, acceptance, belonging. And where is the purpose or the meaning? It would be out of this list. We don't normally play because it's our mission or purpose. Well, it can be our purpose to have fun. But it's also true that good games give us new purpose and generate new meaning. So I leave you for now with these possible activities. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you around in our online Google Plus community and next chapters. Bye!